Can you hear me? Okay. Um, well, I want to thank uh, Bookmine for allowing me to make this presentation uh, tonight. Um, I, I understand uh, Judge Diane Price and Judge Ron Young are in the audience. I want to say hi to my colleagues and Guy Sandler, uh, a colleague of mine as an attorney. Um, and I want to congratulate Judge Tisher on becoming a grandparent uh, a day ago with uh, Ian Tisher, her grandson. So uh, with that, I, I want to, uh, again, thank Bookmine. And I'd like to start just real briefly with what the book is about in its most basic, simple uh, manner. It's a true crime story about a Napa citizen, Anita Fajani Andrews. Anita was uh, struck by a tragic event on July 10th, 1974. Her life was lost unjustly, incomprehensibly, and unexpectedly. And that in its most basic terms is what the, the case is about. Um, I also want to tell you that I, I'm very honored uh, to have the trial team here that actually uh, put the trial together and prosecuted it and defended it. Uh, we have um, the district attorney, uh, Paul Giroux, uh, and Paul uh, was, uh, is now the assistant DA only to Allison uh, Haley, who is the district attorney. He was the prosecutor at the time and was the lead for the prosecution. I believe Scott Young, who's now a judge, was an assistant attorney, but Paul was the lead uh, attorney for that. He was, uh, his trial team consisted of Detective Don Weiniger, who is here tonight too, and I'll try to get them introduced on the screen. And Don had worked up the case and brought it to the DA who then um, uh, filed a complaint. Um, and then there's Leslie Pate. She, uh, at the time, uh, she was Leslie Severe. She got married. But Leslie uh, was an uh, investigator with the DA's office and um, Paul specifically asked for her. And uh, it was a wonderful team. Um, and the trial went really well for the uh, prosecution. Um, but the defense was ably defended by Allison Walensky, who is also here. And I thank you, Allison. Um, it, it, it was a tough job for Allison. As a public defender, you don't get to pick your client and you don't um, uh, get to pick your facts. Uh, you're stuck with them, uh, but Allison is a professional um, with over 60 jury trials and uh, was up to the test and really uh, did a, a, a really good job. And in part, that's because the DA didn't have a slam dunk. They were able to show the defendant, uh, Roy Melanson, was in the bar, but they couldn't put him in the storage room where the murder um, happened. So those were the lead players who are here. And again, I thank you very much. I'm very honored. Um, I, I, want, I also want to tell you why I wrote the book. Uh, I, I wrote it because I thought I had a unique perspective. I was the trial judge, so I got to hear the evidence from the beginning to the end. And I'm a native Napin, and so I, I knew all the old officers and the new officers uh, that came along. Because over a course of 37 years, this, this took that long because it became a cold case. Um, over the course of 37 years, uh, some of the old guard retired or passed away, and then the new guard of police and law enforcement came into being, and I knew them all and um, went to school with some of them, uh, went to school with some of their children. Um, so uh, I, I felt like I had uh, that um, perspective. Uh, I also uh, wrote the book so I could lay out the trial. And, I, and, the, and in true crime stories, a lot of times the trial part is frankly pretty boring. Um, but I put it in uh, because I tried the case and I was so aware of it. Uh, and I also uh, believe that people in, out there may be curious about what happens in jury trials behind the scenes. You know, a judge is supposed to only admit um, legally admissible evidence so behind the scene where the jury doesn't hear, there's all these motions that are argued and the judge hears it, the jury doesn't, and the judge makes some ruling. And um, those are the things that went on that I've contained in the book. There was also um, a witness that 
Paul Giroux, the lead uh, prosecutor, had to decide whether to call or not. The jury never knew about that. Uh, that that's in the book too. And uh, so things behind the scenes I thought might be interesting to uh, people thinking of going into the law, people who uh, are young lawyers and wanting to know uh, what a jury trial is from every step, both inside and, and in front of the jury. Um, I, um, I think also this book depicts a small town with uh, a small town police department and um, uh, and a good uh, police department and how it operates and how it's motivated. So all, all those factors were uh, reasons why I wrote the book. I also have to tell you, you learn a lot um, about uh, the case, not uh, you would think from being the trial judge, but I learned a lot more about the case when I was writing the uh, book because uh, I get to see myself uh, things that I, I, as a judge, was, was not entitled to know. And so I got to see the original police reports and all the suspects they uh, interrogated and how they got to uh, the way they uh, arrived at the prosecution. Uh, a judge is not supposed to know anything about the case until it's in front of the judge. And there's a code section right on that that says that. And that's so the judge doesn't come in with preconceived notions about things that aren't even uh, admissible in a court. Um, so that may seem a little odd that the judge doesn't know all the, the, the investigation, but he or she shouldn't know that and you don't know it. Now, obviously in the tr trial, the judge is asked to rule on matters that he or she may keep out of evidence. Well, that's um, uh, the, the judge starts to learn about the case, but only at that trial level. Um, I think I'm going to, uh oh, I want to, um, Elena, I want to show my slide. So you'll go down to that share screen at the bottom. Got it. <laughs> it's not coming up. How about that? No. Uh, oh, there, there it is. Okay. Okay. So there you go. Perfect. Are. Thank you. Thank you. Um, th that's a picture of the cover and the uh, and what Bookmine did. Um, it almost looks like a happy scene, but it's um, it's just the cover. But um, um, I want to talk about the victim and her family. Um, uh oh. Uh, there. All right. The uh, this is a picture of the Fajani family, uh, and you can see um, on on my left as I'm looking at that picture is Anita Fajani. That is the victim. Uh, she was a. a 18-year-old beauty queen, Miss Napa County. Uh, she was murdered when she was 51 years old. In the center is her father, uh, Nicola Fajani. He uh, opened the bar in 1945 and uh, ran it until his death in 1969. And on the other side of Nicola is Muriel Fajani. Muriel was a school teacher and uh, also kind of a a gadfly of governmental agencies. She always seemed to be at every meeting you could think of. And she was uh, not always welcomed because she could drag out a meeting, but she was very intelligent and had some really penetrating good questions at board meetings. Um, in any event, um, I want to tell you that when Nicola died uh, in 1969, um, uh, and let me show you the bar. Oh man, here we go again. Uh, Let me just click that. Just click up next. Please. Okay. I don't know why that's working better. All right, that's a picture of the bar um, on Main and Third Street, and you can see the Fajani sign. It's where uh, the restaurant Avow is now, um, and I got the photo from the historical Napa Historical Society. Uh, 
from their courtesies. And um, that shows the um, uh, picture from that corner. This is the picture of Fajani's uh, across the street. And you can see better that cocktail uh, uh, sign, as well as the tile, that kind of a art deco tile that I thought was so pretty and was hoping no one would remove it. Um, you also get into the bar itself and you can see uh, the bar, uh, which was on the left side as you entered. And on the right side was the pool table and the jukebox and some taxidermy uh, deer heads overlooking the whole scene. And there's the bar uh, uh, looking at the entrance of the bar. Oops, I'm getting ahead of myself now. How do I go back? Ah, I think it's down here. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so the circumstances uh, are that um, Nicola dies in 1969, and Fajani's bar has a very valuable um, uh, um, liquor license. It's a on-sale, off-sale license that the ABC Commission doesn't um, uh, allow anymore. And what it meant was Fajani's, uh, with the on-sale, off-sale, was both a bar and a liquor store. I mean, you could go into the bar and or get a six pack of beer and, or a bottle of uh, alcohol and buy it and take it off premises. That made it a very valuable uh, license. And so if you didn't run, keep it running for six months, I, I think that was the time period, you lost that license. So the girls, Muriel and, um, and Anita, kept operating the bar, even though they both had uh, full-time jobs. Uh, Anita worked at um, the Napa State Hospital as a secretary, and Muriel was a school teacher. Muriel wasn't that good with uh, people skills, so she did the books and other things like that, whereas uh, Anita, who was a, a more of a people person, tended the bar. And that's how you end up uh, they were operating it. Anita would come in at 5, 5.30 and operate it as long as she wanted, usually 9 or 10 o'clock, depending how many people there, depending how tired she was, depending if she wanted to do something. So, uh, but it was to keep that license in effect until maybe they sold the bar. Um, This is the headline on uh, Anita was murdered on J July 10th, 1974. This is the headline on July 11th, 1974. Woman found murdered in family's downtown bar. Pictured there, it's hard to see, but it's Jim Boitano, the district attorney of Napa at the time. And on the right is Muriel Fajani. Uh, that's when um, that happened. And on the evening of that um, murder uh, in a small town. The police have a, a routine for uh, uh, looking after uh, the establishments. Um, they knew the bartenders, they knew the um, uh, owners, they knew how to patrol these places. And for Fajani's, their custom was to drive by the front of the bar and uh, with the aid of their spotlight, they could shine it on the door. If the door was locked, the sign was still up and Anita's 1967 Cadillac was parked right in front. If that was the situation, then everything was fine. The pol police knew that the bar was uh, not closed uh, for the evening. However, um, if um, the light was uh, on the sign was gone and the bar was locked and the car was gone, they knew the bar was closed. Um, unfortunately, on this evening, uh, the car was gone, but the door was unlocked. Um, had the patrol officer noted this, uh, he may have investigated it right then and there, in which case he would have uh, seen uh, the, the body or he may have even intruded when it was happening and maybe lives would have been saved. Not, maybe it would have been too late for Anita, I don't know, depending on the timing, but uh, the, the next murder by Melanson was up in Colorado 51 days later. So if, if 
if the officer had looked right then and there, they would have had a head start on finding uh, Melanson, and it may it may have uh, really saved uh, some lives. Um, the investigation was intense. Uh, the police back then, it was really impressive to read um, what they did. They did everything. Um, Boitano was known as a frugal man, and uh, he um, he would, uh, uh, there, there's a picture of Jim Boitano. Um, he, he was said to have his, uh, still have his first nickel, uh, but he spared no expense on this. On the very morning that he discovered the body, he was down there with the police uh, officers and he called Berkeley uh, for a criminalist, Peter Barnett. That's because Napa didn't have a, a criminalist. Uh, they had some officers who were, you know, uh, trained uh, uh, and, and were actually very good, uh, but uh, uh, Boitano wanted someone who would qualify as an expert and testify at the trial. And he brought in a young criminalist from uh, Cal Berkeley, uh, a scientist uh, who was 27 years old, Peter Barnett. And the odd thing is when this went to trial 37 years later, Barnett testified and he was now 64 years old. So we had, uh, the police had him then and they had him at the trial. Anyway, uh, he and the officers uh, saved everything, which I found very amazing because in 1974, there was not the uh, inexpensive DNA testing. Their DNA was pretty much unheard of then, and um, uh, but they preserved everything. Every every uh, well, the big thing is they preserved the little cigarette butt and um, the and the towels and and everything, and that really helped. Uh, solve the case later on, decades later. Um, this is the bar stool um, that was pushed out. It's a I showed you before the bar with all the stools, but um, this was the bar stool that the suspect, Roy Melanson, sat on. And you can see some items of evidence up there, which I believe was a cigarette and the, maybe the screwdriver. Uh, there's the cigarette. Uh, that was found, and that became crucial in finding DNA evidence that uh, Detective Weiniger uh, sent to the Department of Justice, where Michelle Terra and the other people up there um, found a hit on the on the on the cigarette. There's the screwdriver, and there is a towel that's in the back of the bar. That was important because of again some DNA evidence because. Uh, Paul Giroux with that cigarette and, and the, the team could show that Melanson was in the bar, but they couldn't put him in the storage room or behind the bar. This towel helped put him behind the bar um, because of DNA again. Again, the police were um, so impressive on who they interviewed. This is a picture of the Connor Hotel. Connor Hotel uh, is gone now, but it, it it, that's where the Veterans Park is, right across the street from Avao, which was Fajani's. Um, that was fraught with possible suspects because uh, it was uh, in 1974 and uh, governor at the time, Governor Reagan in 66 and beyond when, uh, after he was elected, um, sort of released people from, or did more than sort of, he released a lot of patients from the state hospitals. They ended up, a lot of them, at the Connor Hotel, uh, where social workers put them up and helped house them. And also, the Vietnam War, uh, people coming back with PTSD, very, very troubled, were, were living there, too. And there were some people in there that were very violent. Um, and so the police immediately um, sw you know, swarmed that place and got the role and checked for people that had checked out uh, the day of the murder or the night of the murder, who had checked in the day before and checked in general on violent people. They also, of course, went to Anita's uh, uh, place of employment, the Napa State Hospital, where there were people locked up who were violent, who were rapists and who were murderers. And Anita did have contact, she was a secretary, but she did have contact with other, with, with patients in the, on the ground. So they looked for something like that. Nothing turned up. Um, there were, um, uh, the, the case went cold, which simply means there were no more leads. 
and um, and and finally the police stopped uh, chasing every lead and um, kept the evidence, of course, and it went cold. Some big police departments have a cold case unit where there are attorneys who work um, and, and investigators, I'm sorry, that work just on those cold cases. But here Napa didn't have the luxury of a cold case unit. So any officer, and there were a lot of the older officers that couldn't stand that this wasn't solved and it haunted them. Uh, Jarecki was one of them uh, who was a captain and uh, his, his son and his granddaughter are part of the sheriff's department is quite a legacy there. Um, he, it, it haunted him until the trial, he was still alive. Um, in any event, um, th they were uh, actively pursuing this and um, with decades going by, uh, anyone who worked on the cold case had, to, any officer had to do it while they still did their uh, current caseload. And that was difficult because there's a lot of pressure to solve your current crimes. This one's cold, it's not going anywhere, it's dormant. And so uh, an officer would try and then have to go back to his caseload. Um, but as decades went by, there were scientific advances and uh, DNA uh, became um, really helpful to law enforcement. And then they, with computer technology, they were able to come up with the CODIS indexing system, which just stands for uh, Computer DNA in Indexing System. And it was a national system. So if there was, uh, you could electronically send in uh, the DNA to, to see if there was a match for a missing uh, person or a suspect um, or a, a person sitting in jail. Um, and that's exactly what Don Weiniger, the detective, the chief did. He sent it to DOJ in, uh, uh, he, he became assigned to the case in 2006. He still had to work on to have a caseload. But at some point, uh, a little after that, he sent it in and got a match from DO DOJ. And uh, that's when um, he had um, got a hit on Roy Melanson, who was sitting in Fort Lyon in Colorado State Prison on a murder charge. And um, I wanted to read a passage of the book to you. Uh, <clears throat> Weiniger's first move was to look into the circumstances of the conviction that led to Roy Melanson being housed at Fort Lyon Correctional Facility in Colorado. He discovered that on October 1st, 1993, Melanson had been convicted of first degree murder of Michelle Wallace um, in Gunnison, Colorado, which had occurred sometime between August 29th and September 1st, 1974 and he was serving a life sentence. So he committed it 51 days after he murdered, presumably murdered Anita, yet he wasn't caught for that until the 90, uh, 1993. Um, this fact hit Weiniger right between his eyes. The murder of Anita Andrews occurred in Napa between 10 p.m. on July 10th, 1974 and 9 a.m. on July 11th, 1974. About 50 days later, Melanson had murdered Michelle Wallace in Colorado. This was shocking in and of itself, but if Melanson had murdered Anita Andrews, then he was a serial killer. And that was uh, really amazing. Um, I, uh, I would really like to, um, this is the 1967 uh, picture of, of the Cadillac that uh, we lost all trace of. I, I would like to um, ask Detective Weiniger, uh, uh, how he felt about um, when he discovered uh, uh, Melanson and the hit um, and uh, how he felt when he realized he may have a, a very bad guy on his hands. Um, uh, could you unmute yourself and- I can, can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right. You know, it was, uh, I was just, it was awesome actually. It was, uh, you know, you're just working a case and I sent it in not expecting anything initially, really. And then all of a sudden uh, she called me, I was sitting there at my desk and she said, we got a hit. I just couldn't believe it. I just, it was, it was just, it was fabulous. I remember going in and telling my uh, commander, Andy Lewis, and 
it was just an exciting day. It was very exciting because all that work, I initially never really thought of solving the actual case. It was more doing every single thing I could possibly and letting Muriel know that the PD had done, the police department had done everything possible to uh, you know, attempt to solve this crime, not realizing that it was actually gonna happen. And when I, when I got that hit, I realized this could happen. It was awesome. Thank, thank you, Don. Um, there is a picture of Detective uh, Don Weiniger uh, some years ago, and um, you still look good, Don. Uh, I, I think I have the trial team coming up. Yeah, here, here is uh, Paul Giroux, who's here, Leslie uh, Pate, and uh, Detective Weiniger. Uh, I, I think that may even be in Fajani's, I'm not sure. But um, uh, Paul, if I could ask you now, uh, if you could unmute. Um, sure. Could you tell us, Paul, um, once uh, Don got the hit, he then, um, I think, with you, uh, authored a, a search warrant to Judge Croyer, and the case was on. Uh, could you tell us, is that when you selected your trial team? Uh, yes, right. Uh, I knew I'd worked with Don before, and he was a great interviewer. And uh, uh, he, he just makes suspects feel very comfortable. So I was thrilled with the idea of Don working on uh, the Napa case and uh, the Colorado case. And uh, I selected uh, Leslie because she was a great investigator and she was gonna research. I said, find out everything you possibly can about Roy Melanson. And so she went to work on everything prior to Napa and Colorado. And uh... Leslie, you, you discovered uh, quite a history on Melanson, did you not, in your research of him? If you could unmute. Yes, I did. Um, there were a lot of victims I ended up talking to. Um, found out a lot of people were referred to him as a monster. I mean, I had multiple people tell me that um, through my conversations. Um, uh, one of the things that stood out to me with this case is, you know, July of 1974, I literally was, wasn't even born yet. I was born two months later. So, you know, talking to all these people that went through all of these things because of him, it was, it was insane to me. Thank you. Um, so um, I wanted to introduce uh, Allison Walensky, who was the defense attorney. I don't see her up here. Um, there's a picture of Allison. Are you, are you here, Allison? You were before. I guess we've lost her. Um, no, I'm here. Oh, okay. Uh, Allison, um, after Paul and his trial team uh, put this together and a complaint was filed in court, uh, Melanson goes to court and uh, asks for a lawyer. He couldn't afford a private attorney, so he asked for the public defender and then you were uh, personally assigned to the case. Is that how it went? That is how it goes. Okay. And um, you are, as, as a defender, you're, you're stuck with the facts and, uh, and stuck with your client. Um, but you, you did get uh, experts uh, to testify on the DNA to try to contest it, as well as you had investigative services to help you too. Is, is that right? Yes, we were able to through the office hire a DNA expert. Uh, I believe that's the only expert we used. She was helpful, not just in testifying to the jury, but I had to get up to speed on DNA evidence as well. Okay. Thank you, Allison. Um, Paul, are you here again? I, I've lost Paul now. Um, I'm here. Yeah, Paul, um, I was hoping you could uh, tell me um, I, I think I said this already, but this wasn't a slam dunk case because the DNA evidence could put um, Melanson at the bar, but not in the storage room where the murder took place or even behind the bar, except for this piece of uh, towel that was sent in. Um, so uh, you uh, had Leslie look at all the prior crimes to see if you could get those admitted into evidence. and. Uh, when the trial got near, 
um, you made a motion uh, to admit some of these crimes, uh, uh, past crimes. Uh, and what was the purpose of that, if, if you could explain that? So uh, my theory on the case was that uh, he was a serial rapist. I think we found uh, at least seven women that he had raped and that uh, he went to jail or prison for a lot of them. And so my theory was is that he got tired of being uh, held accountable. And so he started um, raping and then murdering women. So, and we knew about uh, Napa, Colorado, and then uh, at least one other in Louisiana. So, um, so in order to show that that was his modus operandi, that he would would rape and then later rape and murder, um, we felt that the other crimes were important. Yes, certainly. And and Leslie, did you have to do a lot of that uh, interviewing of those uh, victims or their or their families uh, of the deceased victims? Yes, I did talk to quite a few of them. Um, we traveled to uh, Texas and Louisiana, the three of us, and ended up talking to a few of them there as well. I, I wanted to t uh, say that at the end of the book, I do have a chapter on the consequences of a murder. You know, it's not just the victim, it's the havoc it wreaks on the family and their friends and the lives that they destroy. And I I recall that uh, you contacted one lady uh, who was raped by Melanson and um, she had was when she was young and not even married and she had married and had children and she had never told anybody about it. And when you got her, she was still, still alive, obviously. And I think you said she just broke down in, in tears crying about it. Yeah, she did. Um when I, she was actually raped by him in the 60s and um, she had just left work, um, wasn't very far from her work and he portrayed himself as a police officer. So she stopped her car and he ended up raping her. And when I called her, she just got completely silent. There was a silence on the line for quite some time. And then she kind of tried to tell me that I had the wrong person and then she backtracked and told me she, that I was talking to the right person and that she was, she couldn't even believe I was bringing it up because she had never told anybody. Um, and she didn't, she just didn't want to talk about it again. Yes, uh, P Paul uh, was sensitive um, and he didn't bring her into court. He just used her, the conviction against Melanson for that. Um, there was also uh, talking about the consequences of a murder and to, to family members and, and, and even loved uh, friends. There, there was a one, um, and I don't know, Leslie, if it's you or uh, someone else who researched it, but there was a one who was um, raped and murdered and she was engaged. I think this might've been in Texas or Louisiana. She was engaged and it was a small town and the town and the family of the deceased always blamed the fiance. And, and in the small town, he was sort of shunned. He didn't move, he stayed there, but he was always, and, and his family and the victim's family, you know, who were real close had fallen apart. Um, it ruined uh, his life. Um, do you recall that, Leslie? Yes, I do. I. His name was um, Lejeune, Lejeune, Vince Lejeune, I think. Um, I remember talking to him in Louisiana and he came up to me after we met um, with the authorities there and th shook my hand and thanked me and said he could not um, thank me enough for changing his life because it, he, it had been so horrible for him because the entire town had shunned him and believed that he was the one who killed Charlene Sauerwin, I think was her name. Yes, it was. Yeah, thank you very much, Leslie. And of course, I don't wanna forget the two daughters of Anita. Um, they, they, were, uh, the, they were devastated, obviously. And they, I just remember uh, the letter they sent for sentencing. They didn't wanna come up, not that they didn't care, but they didn't wanna relive it, but they still told the effects of missing having their daily chat, they were in their 20s and they didn't have their daily chats with their mom, who was the glue of the family. They didn't 
she could never see the grandchildren grow up. Um, they were devastated. Um, there were some surprises in, uh, let me see the next slide if I can. Oh yeah, there is Roy Melanson, uh, his mugshot, it's in Orange, Texas in 1975. That was the best one I could get to show what he looked like in 1974 uh, when he um, murdered uh, Anita. And now this was a, a key witness and I know Leslie, I apologize for picking on you, uh, but I, I know uh, that you had a rapport, some of the investigators established a rapport with a witness, and uh, you and he were very close. He was terminally ill at the time. He was in the bar that uh, evening uh, with his two friends when uh, he saw this man uh, down at the other end of the bar, and uh, he went to the restroom and came back and uh, shook his hand um, because there had been a possibility of some trouble with one of his friends uh, yelling at him. And so he shook his hand and probably had a 30 second conversation. And um, then 37 years later, he's in court. Uh, he's terminally ill, David Luce, and Melanson's in a wheelchair and he's in a wheelchair. And there were two old men in wheelchairs staring at each other. And um, as I recall, maybe it was you, Leslie, who told me, uh, I remember he said, uh, he said, because my clerk told me that he said he was already beyond his expiration date. That's how he said it, because he was supposed to be deceased by then due to his cancer. But um, I, I, I think maybe you said he, he was determined to do justice or determined to at least testify. C can you speak to your friendship almost maybe with David Luce? Yes, so we had a few long car rides um, we, from Chico to Napa, um, I think at least four different times. Um, he was uh, very determined to get on that stand, but he was also extremely nervous and he would get very emotional um, at times even because he was so scared that he wasn't going to be able to provide any type of justice for Anita. Um, he said that he, he couldn't stop thinking about it. And so he did not want to leave this world without being able to do just that. No, oh, thank you. It, it did seem that way. Um, Don Weiniger, um, your, your thoughts on, on uh, anything you want to say um, about the case? Well, about David Luce, I just remember uh, going through the case, going through the file and finding witnesses and finding ones that were alive because several had passed away. And he was the one that was out of the three people that went into the bar that night uh, that saw uh, Roy Melanson, David Luce was one of them. And so I was really excited when I left, found him on the internet and he was alive at, living up in Chico. And he was, uh, he was, he was funny. I mean, he had, he, even though he was, he had cancer. And when I met him, I drove up to Chico. He had, uh, you know, he had oxygen, met me at the door. Just, he was a pretty gregarious guy and uh, very helpful. And uh, well, he picked Roy Melanson out of the photo lineup. And I just, I thought that was incredible. Yeah, yeah. Really incredible. And uh, I was just, I really liked him. He was just a good guy. You could tell he was just a good guy. Uh, and Paul, any any uh, final comments about either Luce or the trial itself? Well, I would say from a prosecutor's point of view, we needed a few important um, items in order to go forward. Uh, one was uh, David Luce saw him in the bar. Uh, one was the incredible luck that the criminalist who collected all the evidence was still alive and could come testify. And the other was that um, when Don interviewed uh, Mr. Melanson in prison, he, um, instead of saying I was at the bar, had a drink, and then I left and the, a guy who looked like a killer walked in right past me. Instead, he said, I've never been to California and I've never, I don't even know where Napa is. So. There, there was some, some of those 
things really were helpful and certainly Mr. Luce was one of them. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought that up because Don in his interview up at the prison with Melanson was able to catch him in a lie and um, that hurt, hurt his credibility right away. Um, and Allison, um, I, just some final comments. Um, uh, you, you probably get uh, questions about uh, how can you defend people like this, and um, you might want to speak to that or anything about the trial. It was probably one of the most interesting trials I ever did. Um, there was a lot of, in the reports, both from the Colorado cases, Louisiana cases, anybody who had met Mr. Melanson, uh, although he was called a, a monster, they all said the same thing, that he was incredibly charming. And I gotta tell you, in terms of client, he was absolutely charming and agreeable and easy to work with. Um, so I can see what these women who had bad contact with him meant when, he said, when they said that you could be charmed by him. Um, you know, it was a challenge but my position always was, were it not for his uh, prior rapes, rapes and murders, he would not have been convicted because he could only be placed at the bar. Once the jury, the jury learns, of, learns of his character, um, not only is he someone who was at the bar, he's suddenly the only rapist and murderer who was at the bar and there is no overcoming that. Um, how do I represent people like him? It, it is what my job is, and it's an important job. Um, you know, for every Roy Melanson, um, there's somebody getting arrested for something that they didn't do. And it's not up to me to pick and choose who I think is guilty or not guilty. My job is to make sure that everybody else, the investigators, the prosecutors, my job is to make sure everybody else is doing their job. And if they're doing their job and they're doing it properly, justice is almost always done. And that's my job to see it. Thank you, Allison. And I will, uh, I do wanna support what you said. Uh, uh, a Stephen Jackson, an author, uh, wrote a book about the Colorado killing and hit the title of his chapter of his book was Smooth Talker. Um, and that was said, you know, he could get, he'd find some woman in a vulnerable position, a flat tire or something, and, and came on so so uh, kind and nice and could talk them into things like that. So uh, what you say about that was, uh, his conduct was monstrous, but he was a smooth talker and a lot of the serial killers are good at uh, convincing people. Um, he, was, he was quite the Southern gentleman. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, so th thank you. And um, I, I, think, I, I think that's really all my presentation. And there may be some questions for uh, some or uh, all of the uh, guests that we have here. Okay, thanks so much, Ray. Uh, do you wanna stop sharing your screen? Sure. And that way we can get uh, your face biggest on here. We do have some questions in the chat box um, and we are happy to take about 15 minutes or so to answer them. Again, I ask everyone to keep yourself muted. If you have any more questions, feel free to put them into the chat box. I'm just gonna ask them of Ray as uh, we move through the questions. So the first one I have here is from Holly. How many prior victims did the jury hear about? Oh, that's a good question. Um, Seven were presented to me in a pretrial uh, motion by Paul. Uh, uh, Allison Walensky, the defense attorney, fought that uh, uh, strongly and, uh, because she knew that if uh, these things were let in to evidence, it would be very harmful for her to uh, defend her client successfully. Um, I believe I let in four of the seven uh, priors that were presented to me. Thank you. Next question from Nancy. Um, was it known what brought him into Napa? Yeah, that, um, that, that I think is one of, I'm really glad for that question because that is one of the uh, questions that um, maybe Don Weiniger knows, but as I recall, 
one of the things that bothered Don Weiniger to this day, Detective Weiniger, is uh, a four month gap uh, from the last time he traced him in April to, um, to July 10th of uh, 1974. I don't know where he was. I don't know how he, I don't know how he got to Napa. Uh, he seems like he was a drifter. What brought him to Napa? No one knows. D Don, would you, maybe that's, uh, you want to add to that? You know, it's, it's, it's one of those things that I could not uh, find out and it's bugged me the whole time. I had a, a, I just, I followed his life from basically birth all the way up up until four months prior to the murder. And then after the murder, I have his whole life, uh, you know, figured out. But those four months, I just wanted to know, I mean, was there any other victims? Were there, where was he? How did he get to Napa? All those things. I just, I just don't know. I'd like to find out. Thank you both. Next question is from Joan. Is he still alive? And if so, is he in prison? Um, he's, He's not alive anymore. He, uh, I was informed uh, very recently, um, I had checked from time to time, and I think Allison Walensky had checked from time to time uh, if he was alive, but he passed away, I believe, in May of this year. Thank you. And, and with that, by the way, uh, go those secrets. Uh, uh, we, Don can add to this too if he wants, but we, no one figured out what he did with the car car was never seen again. Now, even if it was put in a river or something, you'd think after all these decades, it, it might have emerged anyway. Next question from Holly. Um, was Anita Andrews also raped or sexually assaulted? I, I from the evidence, I would say uh, there was a sexual assault. Um, he had, I don't know if this was his signature, but one her stocking was removed from the left leg and uh, and the other, the one on the right leg remained. And there were some priors he had where that same thing was done to the, those victims. But there was no um, no evidence of the of an actual rape, but but the um, experts said there was a sexual assault. Next question. Um, I heard the new name of the bar, a vow, which is what's there now, has a connection or significance to the murder. Does anyone know if that's true? I don't. I'm seeing a lot of shaking heads. So no, sorry. The mystery remains. Uh, Michael has the question, uh, why was a grand jury indictment sought in this case instead of a criminal complaint? Paul? Uh, could you uh, answer that? You heard the question? Sure. Um, I was, at the time, uh, Muriel was, um, uh, you know, going to die relatively soon, and Mr. Luce was going to die relatively soon. And so uh, by doing an indictment, uh, you can move the case along much quicker. So that was the reasoning. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Diane is curious, Ray, how you went about researching the book. Um, I, I contacted um, the district attorney's office. I contacted Allison from the defense uh, and got access to the original police reports. I also went to the superior court to get my file, uh, not my file, but the court's file, uh, so I could review all the pleadings and the motions. Um, and, um, and then I did interview uh, certain people. Um, I remember interviewing Judge Tischer, uh, people that were around when, when this happened. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Richard is just thanking everyone. Uh, he says this was a great presentation. I, of course, agree. Um, Kathleen is curious, um, what was his occupation? I'm assuming his, she means Melanson. If she means Melanson, uh, I may be corrected by some, but I, I thought, well, a Allison probably knows better than me, but I thought he was a cowboy. Uh, he, he, he had horses. Uh, uh, I mean, he wasn't wealthy, but he would work for people. And I, I viewed him as a, an old cow hand. Uh, Allison? Well, he's passed. So there's no attorney client privilege anymore. Um, he said he was a lot of things I know he was not. 
in the end, I believe that there may be property traced to his family in Louisiana that was a source of income to him. Otherwise, um, I don't believe he ever held a job. Thank you. Um, Angela is curious, Ray, if you sold the mo movie rights to this book yet. No, but um, I don't want the judge to be played by Danny DeVito. I'm hoping maybe, um, I don't know, maybe Brad Pitt. Oh, definitely, for sure. I mean, who wouldn't want to be Brad Pitt? <laughs> Thank you for that great question, Angela. Shirley um, has a question for Allison. Uh, did he ever admit to the murder privately? This is a very complicated area. I can tell you to this murder, he did not ever admit, no. Thank you, Allison. Uh, Martha and Richard are wondering, was Anita's sister Muriel still alive to know of the breaking of this cold case? Yeah. Nods. Yes, um, she was, but I'd rather uh, have it be answered by the person who went to her and, and um, told her that there was a suspect. Uh, was that you, Don, or, or Leslie, Paul? That was me. I, uh, uh, we brought, I brought her into the uh, police department and uh, sat her down and uh, explained to her uh, that we had a suspect, that we had the responsible. And I expected more of a reaction, to be honest with you at the time, but she was, you know, seriously ill, going through some illness. And she did not show a lot of emotion. She wanted to go she just wanted to know why. She wanted to go interview him, Roy Valance, herself, and just ask him why. That's, and that's, that's what she wanted. Yeah, she was under a conservatorship at some point. Uh, when did you tell her? In 2010, was it? Or, or? I believe so. It was right. It was before. You know, it was right around then. Yes, yes, and uh, and then she told her. Uh, uh, Muriel's, I mean, excuse me, Anita's daughter. She, she telephoned Anita's daughter and told, told her. And uh, then I got in contact with her and, you know, developed a working relationship with her. Thanks. And then Muriel, I mean, she, then she passed before the actual trial started. Thank you. Okay, we have another qu a question from Guy. What was the theory that allowed you to admit the prior acts, Ray? The, the, there's a code section right on the um, uh, rapes uh, that allowed that in for propensity for a, the character of, of uh, the, the prior rape on a uh, attempted rape here. And then uh, there was um, a code section also that allowed uh, a, a common plan or design or common uh, designer scheme to come into evidence um, on the um, on the murders, such as the um, stocking being removed from the left leg and remaining on the right leg. That kind of evidence could come in. Thank you. Claudia is curious whether Muriel continued to teach after her sister was murdered. I have no idea. Anyone? Okay, looks like nobody knows, so that remains a mystery. Um, Shirley has a question for Allison. Uh, so he never admitted it, but do you think that he did it? Absolutely, yes. Along with um, many, many other things, yes. Thank you, Allison. Uh, why did the bar remain closed for so long? Kathleen is curious. I, uh, I, I'll, I'll defer to others. I know that um, uh, Muriel was very close to her sister and wanted the crime solved and closed it down immediately. So it was available to law enforcement at any time. She didn't want to run it anymore and she didn't want to sell it. And uh, she, instead of a replica of the crime scene, she had the actual crime scene there. That's where, why we always hear it was frozen in time because everything around it was being refurbished or rebuilt. And she also, she, she would 
be after the police to investigate it. And she would nudge them, sometimes not so gently, to come back, look at this. If you ever want to come in, here it is. That's how um, it was explained to me. Um, to, to, to any of the um, call? I'll just add, uh, she lost an incredible amount of money by never selling or reopening the bar. But she said, I, when I talked with her, she said, I didn't know what DNA was or, you know, obviously when, in, when this happened, but I knew that there'd be some advances in technology that at some point, um, what we had in this bar would be important. So she said it was not worth it to me to reopen it. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, Kristen is curious, what was the thought behind visiting the bar during the trial, especially with it being under renovation? The um, prosecutor and the defense, um, I, I believe, um, uh, Paul Giroux, I think, made a motion to visit uh, the scene, but I think um, Allison didn't object and they agreed to it. Um, it, it can be helpful to actually see it than, than, than to have photographs. And one of the reasons to allow it, for me at least, was it was so close. It was across the street. It was not going to be a big interruption. We didn't have to drive up into the mountains. And so we could do it. We could do it easily. And we could do it within a, an hour. Thank you, Ray. Uh, Nancy, or sorry, there was one before that. Uh, Tina was curious, was there ever a total on how many he killed? I, I only knew of the um, priors. I, I don't know. Don uh, or Leslie, uh, do any of you know of more than the seven you uncovered? Probably not, or you would have presented it. Um, Nancy's curious, were all the murders done in the same form? Same method, I'm, I'm guessing. There were some that were left out of evidence uh, because they didn't, he had a, a, a rape, I think it was, of his 16-year-old cousin. That didn't follow what he did uh, with uh, some of the other victims. So they weren't all the same form, some were. Thank you. And then uh, a slightly different tack guy is wondering if your next book is going to be a funny one again, since your last two were. That wouldn't be Guy Sandler, would it? <laughs> it, it might be. Guy uh, and I used to work together as attorneys, and he was an extremely accomplished defense attorney. I, I don't know how he um, did so well. He could, he could defend anyone and do a great job. Um, and a part of that was his wonderful humor. So uh, I, I hope to make the next one funny, but I probably won't. <laughs> um, Carol just put a, an interesting comment in the chat box. I'm not going to read it because it's, it's a little long, but for um, folks who want to check it out, feel free to do so. Um, so we're at a little after seven, if there are any any other last questions, I'm going to wait about 20, 30 seconds in case you're furiously typing. Um, so until, unless something pops up, I, I want to thank Ray so much for joining us on this virtual event in a very weird time. Oh, one more question. And this will be the last question from Shirley. Was the screwdriver part of the case uh, that was mentioned? Yes, definitely. The screwdriver was the presumed murder weapon. Uh, she was stabbed 13 times um, in the part of the neck area, and uh, it was washed, uh, it was cleaned later, washed off. In fact, it had even rusted a little, and uh, that may be the reason the towel was in the back of the bar and the screwdriver was in the back of the bar, but it was the presumed murder weapon. Well, thank you so much, Ray. Um, I want to reiterate, we we are actually sold out of Ray's book right now, but I have 100 more coming at hopefully the beginning of next week. So if you want to get your name on that list to get it as soon as they arrive, you can call the bookstore, 733-3199. You can go onto our website, that's napabookmind.com. 
um, and you can order it there. We do ship domestically to anywhere in the US except for Hawaii and Alaska. And um, we can get you a copy just as soon as they come in. I want to thank so much Ray Gadani for, for writing this book on such an interesting chapter in Napa history. And thank you for taking the time to speak with us all this evening. Thank you as well to Don and Allison and Leslie and Paul for joining us as well. This was such an interesting, fascinating event. And it was such a treat to be able to have this whole team of you here with us tonight. Thank you. Elena, can you still hear me? Yes, uh, indeed. Yeah. I, I, I want to echo your uh, thanks to my guests. Thank you, Paul and Leslie and Allison and Don. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Well, I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Again, you can go on NapaBookMind.com to order a book and 